guys, it's Eric here at Farpoint Farms. Welcome back to my series for beginners on solar systems. Today we're going to be talking about batteries. And batteries are a tricky, finicky thing when it comes to solar setups. You can never have too much, but you can definitely have too little. There's also the ability to pick the right battery for the job. So tonight we're going to talk about two different types of batteries. And then we're going to talk about voltages and kilowatt hours and watt hours. And there's a lot to it, but I'll try to make sense of it as we go. Your first choice is what type of battery to go with. We have regular lead acid or AGM type batteries. Those have been used traditionally in solar systems up until say the past five years. On the other side, we have new emerging technologies and those would be lithium batteries. LiPo4 batteries are the most common type now used in new solar setups. It's what I decided to go with when I built and the cost of that technology has come down so rapidly it really doesn't make much sense to go with liquid lead acid batteries. So let's first start, I guess, with the lead acid battery. Lead acid, like I said, is the most commonly used battery in systems up until, say, the last few years when the cost of lithium batteries came down so drastically in price. The battery that you're going to end up with if you buy a, a lead acid battery is going to be roughly 12 volts and 100 amp hours, which is 1280 watt hours. We'll get into those numbers here in a bit. But what you need to know right now is that that battery is going to be about twice, sometimes three times the weight of a lithium battery in the same size. The other important thing you need to know about that is that that battery is not actually 100 amp hours. It is, but if you were to use all 100 amp hours out of that battery, you would have fully discharged that battery and that damages the lead acid style battery pretty heavily. Do that repeatedly and you can rapidly kill a brand new battery. So for the sake of operating it off of solar, you're really only supposed to go to about 50% state of charge. So if I have a 100 amp hour battery, I'm really only going to be using half of that gas tank and then I have to refill it. So when you're sizing out your solar battery bank, if you decide to go with lead acid batteries, you need two batteries for every 100 amp hours that you want to actually have. So don't go by the reading on the battery. Since you can only use half of it, figure double the amount of batteries that you would need for an average lithium battery setup. Now the other bad side to this is that they require maintenance. The off-gas hydrogen, which is highly explosive, so you don't want to have lead acid batteries inside of your house or underneath your, in your crawl space or in your basement. They need to be in an outdoor vented box and you need to be aware that explosions can do occur. The inside is uh, acid. The battery acid is not something that's going to burn your hands, but it can destroy your clothing pretty quickly. And so that's something else to be uh, aware of. And you will have to perform maintenance on the batteries that removes the caps off the top for the individual cells, and you top it off with uh, water, distilled water is what you want to use. You don't want to use tap water or anything other than distilled water because the minerals or chemicals in there can actually damage the cells. You can expect to get three to five years of life out of a lead acid battery used in a solar setup. Although some people are able to nurse them along for seven years, it's somewhat unheard of. Now on the other side, you have lithium. When I started my build project back in 2020, the cost of a lithium battery was pretty painful. I paid over $1,000 for a 200 amp hour, 24 volt battery, and that was used. In fact, it was well used, and it was the most expensive part of the system that I purchased at the time. But now that same setup would cost significantly less. In fact, a 12 volt, 100 amp hour lithium battery now runs for two to three hundred dollars online and the prices are dropping. So by the time you watch this video, it's entirely possible that they've leveled out with the same cost of a traditional lead acid battery. The positives to lithium, well, there's a lot of them. A 100 amp hour battery is a 100 amp hour battery, meaning you can run that battery down to near zero and it won't cause any damage to do so. For that matter, you're using a lot less. Lithium batteries are also a lot lighter. They weighing exactly, you know, between a third and half as much as a conventional AGM or lead acid battery would be. And they have a much longer lifespan. They claim three to 5,000, usually the manufacturer claims three to 5,000 charge and discharge cycles. That's a lot of days. But honestly, if you take good care of them and don't abuse them too much, not too hot, not too cold, They've been known to last a whole lot longer, more average 10,000 cycle times before they fail. 
For that reason, I went with lithium. I recommend you go with lithium, but there are some downsides. In fact, there's just one really, but it's a big one, especially if you live in an area that's cold like I do. The temperature outside right now is 16 degrees. Lithium batteries do not charge under freezing. It can damage the battery. The lithium crystallizes, heating and charging that causes the crystals to break. It damages the lithium and the whole process can fail. So you can kill a lithium battery fairly easily if you're operating it in a below freezing situation. Of course, there are ways around it. You can place lithium batteries inside your house. You can place them in your basement. They do not off gas, so you're keeping them warm inside of your living space. That is a safe thing to do and it keeps them from freezing so that you can use them year round. If you don't have an indoor solution like I do not here at the house, well then you're gonna have to figure out something to do to keep them warm. That can be a bit of an issue because you have to use power to heat the batteries. This is an issue that Tesla cars and other electric cars experience during the winter time. Their range is greatly diminished because a lot of the energy that they have stored has to be used to reheat those batteries so that you can drive and charge the vehicle. It's an issue, it's not the worst issue, but plan on purchasing extra batteries and extra solar in order to maintain the warmth of the batteries. So if you're going to build a 4,000 watt solar setup like I have, plan in the darkest, coldest days of winter that a thousand watts of that per day is going to go just to keeping those batteries warm so that they can maintain a charge and discharge state happily. Now a battery that's a lithium battery will discharge at a colder temperature, but you still don't want to go below say zero degrees. And really I think they say 16 degrees Fahrenheit is about the limit to the discharge temperature. But again, on charging, you want it to be above freezing where you can damage those batteries. That is the first part of battery. So we have lead acid here and we have lithium on this side. From here on out, the numbers I'm gonna give you are gonna be relatively the same. In our last video, we talked about the wattages for charge controllers. Well, wattage and voltage also matter when it comes to batteries. So when you buy a standard 12 volt lead acid battery or a standard 12 volt lithium battery, that's what you've got but you can mark them out and make them into different voltages for a larger system. So let's say you wanna go with a 24 volt system. You simply need to put in to series, that was one after another, and here's a picture of how that works, those two batteries to create a 24 volt system. And it's a little tricky. We got voltage and we have amperage when we're talking about batteries. And so two 12 volt batteries that are both 100 amp hours in series will equal 24 volts at 100 amps. But let's just say you want the reservoir to be bigger and you wanna keep the system at 12 volts. Well, in that case, you would wanna wire them in parallel like this here. That would give you 12 volts at 200 amp hours if you set it up like that. And many systems, my own included, are going to end up with series and parallel connections to achieve the voltage and amperage that we want. In my case, my new system is going to be a 48 volt, 500 amp hour system. It's a very significant reservoir of power. That's going to allow me to power everything that I need to power at my house for eight hours overnight without any issues. And if we have cloud cover, it should continue to do so for three additional days. That's the reservoir I wanted. I wanted to have enough power that if we had terrible weather for day after day after day, that I could get three and a half, almost four days worth of power before the batteries were shut down and I was forced to go back to grid tied power. A 12 volt battery at 100 amp hours is gonna operate a refrigerator or a coffee maker or a microwave for a variable amount of time. And let me show you what you can expect. And of course, as you look at this, keep in mind that the higher the amount of amp hours that you have available, the longer these run times will be. The higher the amount of voltage you have here, the longer those run times will be. And here is another picture that explains to you the difference. How do we get how many watt hours we have operational out of a battery pack? Because 12 volts at 100 amp hour versus 48 volts at 100 amp hour is going to give us a vastly different reservoir, a vastly different amount. And you can see the math here that will give you the available watt hours. That's how many watts you're gonna run and how many hours that will run. So think of it this way when you're trying to decide how to size your system. 
A 12 volt, 400 amp hour system will give you 4,800 watt hours. A 48 volt, 100 amp hour battery system will also give you 4,800 watt hours. That's the way the system is designed. And so your reservoir, even though those numbers might change, you're really changing your amperage and your amp hours, but you're not changing your available reservoir. The size of those batteries will pretty much tell you exactly what's going on. Four 12 volt batteries equaling 100 amp hours or a 48 volt system with only 100 amp hours is still gonna be about the same size. It's just the reservoir you have and the voltages you're running. All right, so now that we know that 12 volts at 400 amp hours is giving us 4,800 watt hours and 48 volts at 100 amp hours is giving us 4,800 watt hours, we've determined how watt hours work. But what we need to figure out now is how much of that do we actually need? How much of that are we gonna use? And so watt hours, you can think of that as your reservoir. That's your fuel tank. How many watts do I have available and how much am I gonna burn throughout the day operating my stuff? And I'm gonna show you a chart here in a second, but let me give it to you the easiest way I can think of. We have something like a microwave, right? In our house, we have a microwave and it takes 1100 watts to run that microwave. I use it an average of 10 minutes a day. So those are the things that I know. In order to figure out how many watt hours that's gonna pull out of my battery pack or how much my reserve I'm using, I'm gonna take that 1100 watts and I'm gonna times it by the 10 minutes per day that I'm gonna use. And then I'm gonna divide that by 60 because we're not talking about minutes, we're talking about hours. And what I'm gonna end up with is 183 watt hours per day. That's the average that my microwave is going to consume at my house. Out of 4,800 watt hours, that's not a whole lot. So that leaves us a lot more to run other things. But then we go back to those cloudy days. Well, maybe it's four days, three days. And so you take in that, and I'm just gonna round up to two, but two, four, six, eight, 800 watt hours if I were to go four days using that microwave for, four, for 10 minutes a day. Does that make sense? And here's a chart that shows you some of the most common equipment that you have out there and how many watts it takes, but you can use that to calculate on your own, right? So it doesn't matter. So a hair dryer, 1500 watts, times it by 10, and then divide that by 60. That'll give you your available watt hours. Let's go with a crock pot, right? We're gonna run a crock pot, it's 400 watts. We're gonna run it for 30 minutes. And so we add the time those two together and then divide it. And again, you're coming up with your watt hours. So when you make these choices, when you're deciding how to size your system, it's really easy for you to say, well, gee whiz, I'm only using you know, uh, 400 watt hours a day or 500 watt hours a day. That's not bad. I could probably run everything off of one battery, but that's not exactly the case. You have to think about the cloudy days. You have to think about the reserve. You have to think about the surge voltage, things that pop high when they kick on and then come back down. So those are all things you'll have to take into account as you size your system. And don't forget that you need to have enough solar to not only run the equipment during the daytime, but also to recharge the batteries from what you used overnight or throughout those cloudy days. So always add more. I would say 30 to 40% more than you actually calculate you need, both in reserve capacity and in your solar panels in order to achieve perfection. I guess that's where I'm going to leave this video tonight. Uh, next time I see you all, we will talk about inverters, which is the, the final portion of this, is wrapping this system together. Inverters are how we take whatever voltage is coming off the solar panel, be it 12, 24, 36, or 48, and roll it out to 120 volt or 240 volt so that we can use it with our household appliances. I hope you're enjoying the series. I know that uh, it's a little bit confusing at times, but hopefully this clears some of that up for you. Till next time, my friends, take care.